Whatever you're doing, don't do it without me. Oh, praise the Lord. I give honor to God, who's the head of my life, to my pastor, first lady, to my husband, to all the ministers on the roster, to the choir, to the musicians, the deacons, and the trustee, and all the saints and friends. God is good. And all the time, amen, amen. Pray with me and for me. Can we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I ask right now that you will hide me behind the cross. Right now, speak through me and use me. Use my lips, my eyes, and my ears so I can hear what thus saith the Lord. Lord, right now, I ask you to, you to speak to your people. Right now, speak to their spirits, O oh God. Let them hear what you have to say to the church. Lord, I love you and I thank you for the opportunity. In your name, Jesus, now let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength and my redeemer. In your name, Jesus, amen. While you're waiting, could you turn to Matthew 1 through 4? My husband's going to come and bring a couple of things for me. Matthew 8, 1 through 4. Amen. Amen. And it reads, When he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt. Thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched them, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. You may be seated. As I was preparing three weeks ago for the message, I praise and thank God for my prayer partner, for the one that fasted with me on the Daniel fast, the one that prayed for me, that held me up. Thank you, Ruthie. Amen. If I had to give you a title to this message, it would be the baggage that you have Jesus is willing to touch it. Again, the baggage that you have, Jesus is willing to touch it. Matthew 8 starts off by talking about this man who had no name, no age, or no known nationality. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about his family either. We don't know how long he has had this dreaded disease. But what we do know is he was exiled to a colony of other lepers where they would die a slow, agonizing, humiliating, and torturous death. During New Testament times, lepers were the outcasts of society. This dreaded disease was highly contagious and now called Hansen disease. When someone contracted leprosy, the priest declared him or her a leper. They were then literally banished from their homes, families, and communities. The definition of leprosy is a chronic progressive bacteria infection and primarily affects the nerves, the lining of the nose, and the upper respiratory tract. Leprosy produces skin sores nerve damage, and muscle weakness. Leprosy spreads throughout contact with the mucus of an infected person. This usually occurs when the infected person sneezes or coughs. Close repeated contact with an untreated person can lead to contracting leprosy. Leprosy like AIDS today was a terrifying disease because there was no known cure. 
in Leviticus, the 14th chapter, it talks about instructions for ceremonial purification from a skin disease. Jesus told this man to go show himself to the priest. Those who were healed must be brought to the priest who would examine them at a place outside the tent. If the priest found that someone had been healed of a serious skin disease, he would then perform a purification ceremony using two live birds that were ceremonially clean, a stick of cedar, some scarlet yarn, and a hyssop branch. The priest, the priest then ordered one bird to be slaughtered over a clay pot with fresh water. He would then take the live bird, the cedar stick, the scarlet yarn, and the hyssop branch and dip them into the blood of the bird that was slaughtered over the fresh water. The priest then sprinkled the blood of the dead bird seven times on the person being purified of the skin disease. The live bird was then released into the open field. The person being purified then washed their clothes, shaved their heads, and bathed themselves in water. They would then be ceremonially clean and could return to the camp, but they needed to remain outside their tents for seven days. This was not the entire process. You can read the rest in, of the purification process in Leviticus 14. Now back to the text. The Bible says when he talking about Jesus had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, it means to observe, look at, see, and take notice. Take notice of what? A leper came and worshiped him. Now ordinarily, Lepers did not come into the company of clean people, no matter the circumstances. The law commanded that lepers was to dwell alone without the camp. Leviticus 13, 45 through 46 says, those who suffer from a serious skin disease must tear their clothing and leave their hair uncombed. They must cover their mouth and call out unclean, unclean. This identified them to clean people. As long as the serious disease lasted, they would be ceremonially unclean. They were not permitted to touch or even come close to a clean person. If a clean person had contact with a leper, this would make one ceremonially unclean whether you contracted the disease or not. Now, we're going to talk about this man that came to Jesus. He had to look pretty rough with his torn clothing and his uncombed hair. How many times do people come in the church looking different than you that don't comb their hair, that don't brush their teeth? How many times do somebody that's homeless come in and sit on the pew in your seat or next to you and they might not smell so right? The Bible says with love and kindness, I draw thee. So do you lean over and say, good morning, sir or ma'am? Or do you move your seat? Oh, help us, Lord. Now, when a person goes to the emergency room, it could be that same person that's homeless. The emergency department receives them, and they have to help them. What about the house of God? This is the hospital, isn't it? Don't we know about Dr. Jesus? Why don't we welcome them just because their skirt is too short? We still have to let them come into the house of the Lord. Who are we? This is not our house. Amen. The Holy Spirit does the drawing, and this individual is looking for help. In Luke, the 19th chapter, the 10th verse, it says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. 
This man had to be filled with suffering and sorrow. He was carrying around the baggage of this horrific disease. He was living under a heavy burden. This man didn't care about the law. All he knew was Jesus would be passing by. From time to time, we all see areas in our lives where we struggle. Sometimes we have bad habits like being addicted to alcohol and even drugs. Or maybe you are afraid to truly trust God to help you with your addiction. John 10.10 10 says that the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But my purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Hallelujah. Jesus gives us life. Until you get Jesus, you're not even living. The life he gives right now is abundantly rich and full. Are you like this man feeling discouraged and defeated? Have you tried everything you know to handle your problems? Have you tried everything in your power to get better? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Are you depressed and stressed with the cares of this world? Do you suffer from anxiety about dying? Are there doors in your life that need to be closed? You may be carrying heavy burdens of sin in your life. Jesus wants to free you from your bondage. Matthew 11 and 28 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke up on you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burdens I give you are light. If you're wondering what a yoke is, it's a heavy wooden harness that fits onto one or more oxen, yeah. enabling them to work together to pull a heavy load. Yeah. It, was, it was weighty and burdensome. Jesus offers his followers a yoke that is easy and a burden yeah. that is light. Yeah. There is an inner satisfaction and a blessed rest when you lean and depend on the Lord. Yeah. When you come to Christ, you know you need a Savior. For those of you who have not confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believed in your heart that He was that God raised him from the dead, you are not saved. And until you receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can't experience the rest that Jesus talks about. You will then have to bear your burdens alone. This comes from Romans 10 and 9. In the text, it also tells us that the man worshiped Jesus. Are you a true worshiper? The definition of the word worship is extreme form of love, a feeling of profound love and admiration. It's a type of unquestioning devotion. If you worship God, you love God. And don't question him at all. In John 4, 23 through 24, it says, But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. This leper went to Jesus and worshiped him. How many times have you gone to Jesus and not even worshiped them first? Thank them for the day. Thank yeah. them for life. Thank them for breath. How many times do you just go, give me, Lord, I need, I need. If thou art willing, thou art able to be cleansed. Yeah. This leper went to Jesus, worshiped him, and said, if thou art willing, thou art able to cleanse me. Oh, praise God. What do you need to be cleansed from? The Bible tells us in 1 John 
1 and 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Yeah. He'll cleanse us yeah. too. Sometimes do you just want Jesus to wash you all over? In John, the 13th chapter, Jesus was washing the disciples' feet. When he got to Simon Peter, Peter saith unto him, Thou should never wash my feet. But Jesus answered him. He said, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not just my feet only, but my hands and my head. Praise God. Our Savior was washing the disciples' feet. Now, how many of you could wash somebody else's stinky feet? Oh, praise them. And all three books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus touched the man with his hands. So let's talk a little bit about touch. The definition of touch is to come in contact with something, especially using your fingers. So this morning I woke up, I got out of bed, I brushed my teeth, I washed my face. I took a shower. I didn't eat this morning, but I did drink some water. Um, what else did you do? Did you eat today? Did you cook breakfast? Did you get things prepared for this afternoon? You touched it with your hands. When we touch something with our hands, we are becoming intimately involved with that thing. We touch thousands of things every day in our lives. Most times we don't even think about it. How many things have your hands touched since you sat in the pew? Your face, the pew to get up, the pew to get down. How many things did you touch? Your Bible, your pen, your tithes. Think about it, so many things. Can you imagine not being able to touch those you love? Mm. Our touch is nothing like the touch of God. Mm. I remember one time when I was younger, I had to hold somebody's hand. Their hand was wet and cold and clammy. And I said to myself, why wouldn't they wipe it off on their pants or something? Ew. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> when Jesus touches you, he reaches his hands into your situation and brings forth change that no man can replicate. Jesus' touch is powerful when we are in, excuse me, Jesus' touch is powerful and unmistakable. Jesus is the potter and I am his clay. Now, I remember when I was in high school, I don't know about you, we used to use a potter's wheel. And on the potter's wheel, you sat down, they gave you a lump of clay, and then you sat there with a sponge and some water. You dipped it, you put it in, and you shaped it, and you molded it. I was trying to make a cup or a bowl, I can't quite remember. But I remember it was all lopsided and messed up, and I got so frustrated. So the teacher told me, don't get upset. You know what she told me? Pick up the clay, yeah. smush it back together, yeah. slam it back down on the potter's wheel, and you can start all over. Yeah. Jesus makes yeah. us, and he molds us, and he shapes us into his image. He does it for us. He put us back on that potter wheel, and he molds us. He's not finished with us yet. Amen. You must allow him to make you and mold you in the person he's calling for in these last days. Do you have baggage in your life? Do you need to be touched? Mm. What did you carry into the sanctuary with you on today? Just today. What has you weighed down on today? The Bible says, Hebrews 12 and 1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Weights that I call baggage are those things that keep us down, that 
tugs at our spirits until there's no joy, there's no peace. It affects our faith and our hope and our trust. I was there. A few weeks ago, I was there where I just, I needed somebody to love me. I needed somebody to come and tell me it was going to be all right. And one day, I heard a knock on my door. Hey, glory. Woo! It was Pastor Miller and the First Lady. They sat down with me, and they talked with me, and they prayed with me, and everything was all right. So, Pastor, I'm so glad you stopped by my house that day. Glory to, to the First Lady. I'm so glad that you took out time for little old me. Glory to God. Oh, hallelujah. This man had to have impeccable faith. He stepped out, took a chance, and believed that Jesus would make him whole. Now, what is faith? 11 and 1 Hebrews says, faith is the confidence that we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. Faith is the substance of hope. Substance is standing under. Faith stands under our hope. It's the foundation of your hope. Faith is the title deed, our pledge to things hope. Faith is the confidence of things not seen. We must walk by faith and not by sight. Yet faith allows us to see the unseen and believe the unbelievable. You must get in your spirit. If God said it, I believe it, and it settles it. Amen. Now, in closing, I must share with you my personal testimony of being delivered from my baggage, which I equate to bondage. I was in bondage, y'all. For those of you that are on Facebook, we read some good things and we also read some bad things. When my sister wasn't in her right mind, she was saying stuff about people and things that really just didn't make any kind of sense. And every now and then, she would say something that had some truth to it. Well, my sister told all of cyberspace that I had been molested. Guess what? That was a truth. That was a truth. For weeks and months, I had to deal with it because everybody knew. I kind of put it in a corner for years. I didn't want to really think about it. I couldn't understand for the life of me why she could do something so mean and, and evil. I had not even told my children. I have five children. My children are friends with me on Facebook, so they didn't know nothing about it. Oh, praise God. Oh, my God, they found out about it. And you know, not one of them came and asked me if it was true. I still yet need to have a conversation with them. Because they just thought it was some of the stuff she was saying that didn't make any sense. Oh, Jesus. Now, oh, my God. Like Pastor McReynolds said, I don't know about y'all. He came here just for me. He said a few weeks ago, it was a blessing in disguise. God wanted me to be delivered, y'all. I can hear the church mothers. I hear y'all. I hear y'all. They saying, baby, some things you just got to keep to yourself. Well, why tell it now? In the book of Revelations, the 12th chapter, the 11th verse, it says, and they defeated him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. So y'all, I got to talk about it. I have to speak about it. I'm not ashamed anymore. Saints, there is freedom in the word of God. Woo, glory. 
John 8 and 36 says, so if the Son sets you free, you are truly free. When I was six years old, I was touched by someone. This has affected my life for the last 42 years. You see, I didn't want to be touched by anyone. Certain touches would send me back to that little six-year-old girl who lived with the shame and the pain. God spoke to me one night laying in my bed, and it was three weeks ago. He said, when are you going to let me touch you? So I kind of looked around. My husband was asleep. He hadn't moved, and I heard it again. When are you going to let me touch you? The baggage you're carrying around, Carol, I want to take it from you. I can feel the tears rolling down my face. You see, I have been to psychologists. I've even seen psychiatrists, but nothing had helped me. So I have learned in 42 years just to live with it. The more I tried to ignore it, the more my husband would say to me, he would say, baby, you need to get some help. And I would say, I'm fine. And he would tell me, you, would need, you need to get some help. How could I minister to you about the touch of Jesus if I had not been touched in my very own situation? Glory to God. So I stand before you, delivered from the bondage of the molestation. Glory, I am a survivor. Hallelujah. Jesus stepped in right in the nick of time. Glory and save me from myself. I, the songwriter wrote it best. Love lifted me. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea, he heard my despairing cry, and from the waters he lifted me. He lifted me, and now safe am I. Hallelujah. When nothing else helped, love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Hallelujah. Now, don't think that it doesn't try to creep back up in my life. Satan brings those thoughts back to me. But the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 and 5, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Jesus wants to touch your situation. He wants to rid you of all your bondage, your baggage. When Jesus touches you, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. When Jesus touches you, greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. When Jesus touches you, you are his workmanship recreated in Christ. When Jesus touches you, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. When Jesus touches you, you can say, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. When Jesus touches you, he will go before you and make your crooked path straight. When Jesus touches you, you can speak to the mountain. It has to be removed if you don't doubt in your heart. When Jesus touched Simon, he then became Peter. When Jesus touched Saul on the road to Damascus, he then became Paul. When Jesus touched Lazarus, he had to come forth. When Jesus touched the water, it turned into wine. When Jesus touched the five loaves and two fish, everyone was fed and there was leftover bread. When Jesus touched the blind men's eyes, they were able to see. When Jesus touched the lame man, he said, take up your bed and walk. Jesus touched many of us with his hands. But the same hands were nailed to the cross. 
Isaiah 53, 3 through 9, in the New Living Translation says, He was despised and rejected. A man of sorrow, acquainted with the deepest grief. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. He was despised and we did not pity. Yet it was our weakness, weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, yes. crushed for our sins. Yes. He was beaten so we could be whole. I'm whole, y'all. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. He was oppressed and treated harshly, yet he never said a word. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep in silent before the shears. He did not open his mouth, y'all unjustly condemned. He was led away. No one cared that he died without descendants, that his life was cut short in midstream, but he was struck down for the rebellion of us people. He had done no wrong, and he never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal and put in a rich man's grave. But early Sunday morning, I said early Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands. And because he lived, we lived. We, we were bought with a price. Jesus wants to touch you. He wants to take away your baggage like he did me and make you whole, which means nothing will be broken and nothing will be missing. Don't wait 42 years like I did. I've been praying for three weeks for somebody here. I don't know who it is, but I've been praying for three weeks. I couldn't call out a name, but all I can do is say, Lord, bless their spirit. If you are in this place and you don't want to go home like you came, I ask you, I plead with you to come to the altar. Bring it to the altar. God will take it away from you. Amen.